Well, good morning. It's so good to see you guys. My name is Lee Thomas, and you are? Let's try it again. My name is Lee Thomas, and you are? Okay, some of you all got it. So my name is Lee, and I have the privilege of serving as your small groups pastor, and it's something I get super excited about, something I'm passionate towards, because you, you heard somebody yelling it even during as we were sitting or taking our seats. Um, my whole goal is to help you find your people. That's what I, I, I was hired not only to do, but that's what I get to do. And so my job description says small groups pastor, but in my office, it just says find your people. And so that is, is something that bubbles in my heart. It's something I wish I could take credit for such a great statement. Um, it actually came uh, by way of, of another small group leader. And so I just want to introduce myself and tell you that we are taking steps to grow the small group community because small groups is important because life happens Monday through Saturday, amen? And so small groups is, is when you find your people. It's when you sit down and it's not the Bible study. Anybody can do a Bible study. Small groups is when life is at its worst, your people are at their best. And so that's why we desire as a next step for every single family, um, some of the small groups God is going to bring into your life. And uh, another small group leader said this, maybe they should be the small groups pastor because they're all the smart people. Um, they said this, they said, Pastor Lee, the reason why we lead small groups is because we know people are going to need us either during certain seasons or certain reasons. And so that just resonates with me. Um, listen at some of the reasons why we're going to be starting some new small groups going into the fall. We're starting uh, something for our singles, and we've already got that off the, uh, uh, off the ground, and so we're trying to grow. If you're a single person in this church, we celebrate you. We don't look at you as a second-class Christian. You are our brother and our sister, and we are excited you're here. If you're, here's another one that I'm excited about. Um, it's, we're going to be starting a small group, and it's called Parents of Prodigals. And I thought this was so amazing because um, one of the things I know is you could be going through life doing your best job as a parent and for whatever reason your child or your grandbaby may decide to go a different way than how you raise them and so we want to provide support in different things and then last Sunday somebody stopped me in the hallway and they said hey Pastor Lee I feel God telling me I, I feel impressed in my heart I want to start uh, a small group that is specifically for remote, remote workers. And I thought, wow, that's, that, that's amazing. So we want to reach the small group community. If you have your Bible, would you go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 12? Romans chapter 12. And I want to be a better steward of my time this morning. I'm notorious as a preacher for the first service. I spend most of my time on point number one, and then I give points three through four, or two through four, and I'll spend like five minutes on it. So for all you type A's out there, I'm gonna try to spend the proper time on each. So let me be a better steward and say, here are our four points. If you're a note taker, um, you wanna write down these four points, they are as following. The whole purpose of, uh, uh, of our series that Pastor Andy is starting is to teach you what it means as a Christian to live an abundant life, an abundant life, a life that is not without lack. 
And I looked at that word abundant, and it has the meaning or the word picture that when Christ fed the 5,000, it says they collected extra 12 basketfuls of fish and bread. That's the abundance that we as the people of God are called to walk into. So my four points, and then I'll start at the beginning, is number one, if you, if you are a note taker, write this down. Four key characteristics of a living and abundant life. And number one is authentic love. Everybody say authentic love. You're saying that now, but it's going to hurt later on, I promise. Number two is service, perseverance, and prayer. Service, perseverance, and prayer. Number three, and this one is not so easy for me, is controlled responses. Control, somebody said hallelujah. <laughs> Being able as the people of God to control our responses, both when things happen that we like and especially when it happens that we don't. And then point number four is living at peace with others. Don't slip out in the back when you hear that one. And so, what does it mean to live in abundance? Romans chapter 12, I'm going to read verse 9 through 21. And the reason why we read the Bible at crossroads is because anything a preacher says that is not from this book, it's just commentary. Okay, we got that, right? And so we go to God's word because we need God to speak to us. We need God to tell us how to live. And it's important, sometimes we read things in the Bible. I know if you've been reading this book long enough, you'll read things in this Bible that will make you suck your teeth. You'll be like, nope, don't like it. Or here's one I see lately is people are like, oh, Paul wrote that. Listen, Paul didn't write this book. God wrote this book. Okay? So when you come across something that you're tended to say, I'm just going to ignore that, remember God is speaking. So here's how he tells his people to live practically. In verse 9, it says this, let love be without hypocrisy. I could stop right there. Let love be without hypocrisy. He goes on to say, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take on your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. And then finally in verse 21, do not become, or excuse me, do not become over, do not be overcome by evil. Instead, overcome evil with good. So let me just say it right from the outset. You cannot do this even if you are a believer in your own ability. This list 
evokes too much human emotion. You mean I gotta be nice to people? Yes. You mean when that person cuts me off coming down 440 and puts me over into the lane with all the potholes? Yes. But more importantly, watch this. This is where he, Paul turns immensely practical. He says, we as the people of God are not only called to love the world, but we're called to love each other. Now you see why you need the Holy Spirit. It has been said, and I don't know if it's true, I don't see it as much, but there are those who have the, the belief that it is easier to love the world than it is to love my fellow brother and sister in Christ. And yet, although it may be easier, it is not what we're called to do. Watch this. The Bible says that we're called to love each other first, and as we love each other, we love the world. And so this is one of those sermons that is not easy. It's not even easy for me to preach because I said for service, I'm a guy, I, I may not be the smartest person, but I geek out on doctrinal truths. Terms like propitiation and atonement and uh, double imputation, all of that. And yet, in the body of Christ, there is this responsibility that we have called, we must first dig into God and his truths and learn and discover just how good God is, how big he is, and how he is able to sustain us, but we are not called to be Bible nerds. Just like we're not called to be social Christians. There is a both and tension. Do you see that? Do you, do you feel that tension, that heaviness of when God is saying, you must love me and in turn you must love each other and you must love the world. And so the Bible encourages us to do both. Never live this list out, walk this list out in your own strength. And so there are two ditches we have to preserve, uh, uh, stay away from. <clears throat> Ditch number one says, if you hear this list and you recognize that as a Christian, I'm called to do this list. I mean, after all, and some of you all do it easier and more naturally than others. Yet, if you do it in your own strength, here's the problem you run into. If you try to do it in your own strength, you become prideful. You start looking down on others who can't keep this list as perfectly. After all, we always compare our perfection to someone else instead of God's word. And so we have to avoid that. Ditch number two says this, you see this list is unnecessary because I'm already saved and I'm sanctified. So I don't really have to do this list. I mean, let's go back to Romans 1 through 11. That's the good stuff. No, this is the outworking of the good stuff. You show me how you treat your family, sir, and I'll show you how much you know God. Let me get difficult this morning. Let me be provocative. Wives, you show me how you speak to your husband, I'll show you how God is working in your heart. And so this is this practical implication. Children, you show me how you're responding to your parents, I'll show you what God is doing in your heart. Whether it's heart knowledge or God is working through his Holy Spirit. And so we need in this series, Pastor Andy's heart is to call us each back to uh, call us out into the deep, if you will, to a more uh, robust faith, a faith that is not focused on changing others, but a faith that is focused on changing me. Everybody say, 
me. A.W. Tozer, before his death in 1963, had this to say about modern Christianity. He says, modern Christianity has been so watered down until the solution is weak. It's so weak that if it were a poison, it would hurt no one, and if it were a medicine, it would cure no one. Wow. So what is he saying? Is he saying that none of us are walking this out? No, it's saying that it's a both and. And if you ever get the chance to read through Romans chapter, the whole book of Romans, I would encourage you to do it in one sitting, but you read the first 11 chapters and they're good. They're telling you monumental truths. And then you turn to chapter 12 and many of us, we read like, wait a minute, let love be without hypocrisy. And then it gets immensely practical, and that's where some of us stop running. We're called to run all the way through the tape, and so I want to encourage each of us here to run through the tape. In 2004, a preacher named J.B. Phillips, he wrote a book to Christians entitled, Your God is Too Small. Anybody ever read that book? It's an amazing book, it's a, it's a fairly quick read, but here was his premise, that many modern Christians have found God, they just have found a God that doesn't seem to be big enough to meet their everyday problems. Because we can sing about God on Sunday, we can clap our hands, but sir, ma'am, young person, do you trust God when you're being bullied at school? Do you trust that God is present? And we as the people of God, are we gonna to come to the rescue or are we gonna say that's none of my business? No. Today's lesson about living in abundance is immensely practical. That's why near the end of chapter 11, I think Paul gets it. Paul has no choice when you read verses 33 through 36 of Romans chapter 11, he has no choice because he has heard and discovered and the Holy Spirit has revealed such amazing truths that he literally, he breaks out into doxology. Now for all of you modern people, the word would be he breaks out into praise. No, nothing? Or as the young people would say, when you hear what God can do, you get turned. <laughs> Still nothing. <laughs> Listen to Paul's words in Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 36. He's just written about the gospel. He's just written about justification and sanctification. He's just come off ending about how his fellow countrymen, even though they rejected the gospel, God still has a masterful plan to include both Jew and Gentile as recipients of the gospel. And he breaks out into this praise and he begins to say, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of God, or who has become his counselor, or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. Yes, even your problems. I long for the day where people who come into these parking lots of our local churches would literally believe, God, I got a problem only you can fix. My small group can't even help me with this. I'm trying to work Pastor Lee out of a job. Don't do that. <laughs> Cause we trust God so much. And there are those of us, I think, as I've been in church work a number of years, there are those of us who either we've made God into a social 
gospel, or we've made God into an academic gospel. And Paul is saying, which one is right? And the answer is yes. We live it out and walk it out practically, but we are encouraged by knowing that we serve a big God. Anybody in the room believe we serve a really big God? So I'm gonna read this excerpt again, and I read it from the, uh, the, the first service, and somebody actually asked if I would send this to them. And so I, 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 I got it out of one of our, my commentaries in preparation um, by a, a gentleman who wrote that commentary on Romans named Kent Hughes, but I'm sure he borrowed it from another person. So I got to find it in the bibliography for all you people who are out there using chat GPT for your sermons. Um, this is not me. This is just like, so listen to what he says. He says, imagine a perfectly smooth glass pavement on which a finest or the finest speck can be seen. Then shrink our sun from 865,000 miles in diameter to only two feet and place the ball, uh, excuse me, and place a ball on the pavement to represent the sun that's two feet in diameter. And then from that ball, step off 83 paces, about two feet per pace. And to represent proportionally the planet that is next, put down a mustard seed, and that mustard seed represents Mercury. Take 60 more steps away from that mustard seed, and then place an ordinary BB, and that BB represents Venus. Mark 78 steps more, put down a green P representing Earth. Step off 108 paces more from there, and for Mars, put down a pinhead. Then sprinkle around some dust on that perfectly smooth black glass. And that dust represents the, ast uh, the asteroid belts. Then take 788 steps more. And then you come to Jupiter and you need to place an orange on that glass in the exact same spot. After 934 additional steps, put down a golf ball for Saturn. Now it starts to get really involved. Mark off 2,086 steps for Uranus and place a marble. Another 2,322 steps from there and you now arrive at Neptune and you need to place a cherry on that glass. This will literally place you two and a half miles from the first object we placed on the glass that represents the sun. And we haven't even gotten to Pluto. He goes on to say, on the surface of this smooth glass, we have a seed, we have a BB, a P, a pinhead, some dust, an orange, a golf ball, a marble, and a cherry. Now guess how far we would have to go on the same scale to reach our first star. Take a guess. 4,000 steps, 2,000 steps. He goes on to say, no, you're way off. We'd literally have to walk 6,720 miles before we arrive at our first star. And so you see that that's just the first star that's represented in our galaxy and there are literally millions of stars in our galaxy and there are literally hundreds of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of galaxies. And as I read this over and over again, it began to dawn on me. And I look at modern day science, and as they look around, they say collectively that our earth is expanding at an ever increasing rate. And it occurred to me, of course it is. Because God said, let there be, and there was. 
And so the universe has no choice but to do that which God has commanded. And unless God says, universe, stop, it will continue to do what it's been commanded to do. So could you imagine how it would go if the people of God got on the mission of God and began to love each other in such a way that Paul is practically talking about what our world would look like, what our churches would look like. I dream of that day, but I also know it has to start within Lee. It doesn't have to start within you guys. It needs to start within Lee. And so this is an amazing, amazing thing that Paul is saying, may our belief in God live out in our walk with God. You can't do it on your own. Jesus says in John chapter 15, he reminds his disciples, listen, unless you remain in me and I in you, you can do nothing. I think about that old adage and I don't know who wrote it, but I wonder if we can say that about the churches in our city. If the Holy Spirit was to remove his presence from our local church, would we even know? Or would we continue to go on like nothing if the Holy Spirit wasn't in our life? And so I want to encourage every one of us as we turn this corner going and finishing in my time remaining, may we be immensely practical. As Paul turns our corner, he says, in verses 9 and 10, he says, let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, give preference, watch this, give preference to whom? Myself. No, to one another. Give preference to one another, but as long as I like them, no. As long as they look like me, think like me, live like me, vote like me, no. He says, give preference to one another, let your love be without hypocrisy. In the first or second century, as Christianity was expanding, it would have been very common for street vendors and street performers to, been, to, to perform on the same street. And many of us, if we're a little bit older and we've been involved in the arts, we know one of the things that represents the arts is the mass that you oftentimes see that represents it, and some will have a smiley face and some will have a sad face. And what Paul is calling believers to do, he's not calling them to switch the face on the mask. Paul is saying, take the mask off. Paul is literally saying, how you love each other, it matters. I think that's why I, I love doing small groups. Somebody stopped me in the hallway and they, they said, Lee, I'm trying, I hear you all the time when you get up and rant and rave about small groups and finding your people. And now Andy's saying, find your people. And now I hope you're saying, yes, all three of you. <laughs> and she said, I'm trying to find my people. I said, I get it, I can help with that. But I had to challenge her just like I challenged everyone. Because the first group you, listen, I've been doing small groups for about a year now, and I'm here to tell you, sometimes the first group you visit, them ain't your people. They weird. No, I'm just teasing. And if you don't know who the weird one is, it's your group. She said, I'm trying to find my people. And she said, like many of you all have said, 
And she began to say this, that, and other. And I said, wait, hold up. We're going to find your people, and I'm going I'm, I'm to work with you. But sometimes finding your people means that you got to become somebody else's person. Because sometimes it's not just about you. Sometimes you got to be around people who are a little bit awkward. Sometimes you got to be around people who are a little bit different than you. That's the body of Christ. He makes no respect of person. Can you imagine if he only saved people who like gymnastics? You guys thought I was going to use football, didn't you? Shame on you. If he only liked or saved people who were equestrians and knew about horses or people who worked in the trades, that's the beauty of our body. As you look in front of you and you, as you're leaving, look at, just look at the people in this room. Nobody looks like you. Nobody is you. And yet we come together under one banner representing Yahweh. That's our Lord. So take off the mask. Don't keep the mask on. Take it off and then let your love be without hypocrisy. How do you know hypocrisy is existing in your heart? Hypocrisy is when you say, well, at least I'm not like, shame on you for filling in the blank. Because <laughs> all you guys thought a name. I know you did. <laughs> Let your love be concerned with what God is doing in your heart. Quit trying to fix people. Yes, things need to be changed. But the body of Christ is different. It's the most amazing thing. It's almost as if our God knew so much about human behavior, he didn't set up little pockets of fix-it people to go fix it. He said, let love be without hypocrisy within Lee. And he starts with Lee. See, the Bible is never meant to change other people. The Bible is meant to change its reader. And if you are reading the Bible, you ain't got time to worry about what other people need to fix. This book will tear you up. I just got Ebonics. I, this book will sanctify you in Jesus' name. So let me say it that way. Because some of you guys were like, huh? Tear you up? What do you mean, tear me up? So we keep on moving. We get to verse 11 and 12. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. This brings us to point number two. We just looked at point number one, which was authentic love, loving each other without hypocrisy. Point number two is service, perseverance, and prayer. We serve others in the body of Christ. It's not easy, I know. My wife is tolerate. Well, I don't think it's tolerated. I think maybe the first three, three years, she tolerated me. Now she loved me. <laughs> but I'm not the same person that she married. I don't lead the same. I don't lead my family. I don't parent the same. I have changed because I quit trying to work on Selly or Selenia. Again, if you're first time hearing me preach, I'm married to the same woman, okay? Selly <laughs> is Selenia and Selenia is Selly. I don't want any rumors out. But preachers at Crossroads, they married to two women, <laughs> not us. Serve others in the body of Christ. Demonstrate perseverance and pray constantly. I'm grateful for the prayers that Sally prays for me. I'm even grateful for the prayers that I now pray for my family, for my two boys. I finally, and you guys gotta celebrate, I, this is quite an accomplishment, I finally have adult children. Yeah. 
if you got ankle biters, I'm praying for you. But I don't want to be you. I remember them days. Having adult children is the most beautiful thing in the world. <laughs> yes. You can go where you want to, get up when you want to, and by God's grace, they are amazing young men, and I'm so grateful that I don't have to worry about them. But I know we're all in different life stages, and so my job is not done as a parent. My job is to come alongside younger parents and help them persevere because we're the people of God. So we're called to service. We're called to prayer. Ian Bounds has this to say about prayer. He says, prayer is the easiest and the hardest of all things, the simplest and the sublimest, the weakest and the most powerful. Its results lie outside the range of human, uh, human possibilities. They are limited only by the omnipotence of God. What is he saying? Our God is all powerful, so when we pray, our prayers are answered because God is, his power is limitless. Number three, controlled responses. Verses 14 through 16 says, bless those who persecute you and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. When I read that last line, do not be wise in your own estimation, admittedly that one hurt. Because for you, you're like, Lee, you ain't that smart. I'm thinking about when I was a 19-year-old young man, and now I'm almost 50. Listen, I would consider myself wise compared to what I used to be. But the Bible, again, the Holy Spirit checks us and says, no matter the degrees, no matter the age, don't ever consider yourself wise in your own estimation. Because our standard is not each other, our standard is God. So let me, before I hit that fourth point, I did this and I, I, I just feel compelled to hammer it home, maybe not as heavily as I did the first service. Let me bo be both prophetic and pastoral in this moment pastoral because sometimes as pastors, we got to say stuff that warns you away and it's not easy to say and prophetic meaning I'm not saying it because Lee is coming up with it, but I'm pointing you back to the book because God has said it. So always watch people who say, I got a word. Pastor Andy did a great job of it last week. when it's like, oh, I want to prophesy to you. Listen, I'm like, it better be in the book because I'm not listening if it isn't. I, I, I just can't afford. My family and the people of God are way too important for me to get caught up in emotions. It probably was bad pizza. <clears throat> not necessarily talking about crossroads, but talking about the global church here in the West and by the West, I mean Western countries, those people who we have a freedom that the rest of the world does not know. The pandemic, I believe, the, the Western church, we did not handle that very well. I'm not talking about policies and procedures. Every one of us have been touched in some way by the pandemic. Maybe you lost a loved one a family member, a good friend. I know we did. What I'm talking about is how Christians started treating other Christians based on wearing masks, not wearing masks, vaccine, no vaccine, and how we started equ equating policy and saying it was a gospel issue and then we acted ugly towards each other. My encouragement is that we would be reminded once again that in this world, 
the enemy sends up things to not only divide the world, but the enemy hates us as the people of God. Let me just say that again. The enemy, Satan, our adversary, the accuser of the brethren and the sisters. Yes, I said sisters. He hates us and he wants to destroy us. And so we as the people of God, we have to coalesce around the Holy Spirit working in our life and not let the things that happen in culture start dictating our behavior and our love for each other. There is an election coming. It comes every four years and it's gonna continue to get more and more divisive. May it never be in God's house. May it never be. Let me end with this last point because I'm out of time. <clears throat> Verse, or point number four is living at peace with each other or with others. For verse 17 and following says, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, watch this, so far as it depends on who? Everybody say, me. If possible, insofar as it depends on Lee, be at peace with all men. What that scripture is not saying is that you go along to get along. What that scripture is saying is that as the people of God, we will see and have different responses to different things. May our opinion not be so big that God is drowned out or he is eclipsed. May we be able to say with grace, with love and mercy. You might wanna be careful going down that path. I disagree with you, but because you're my brother, you're my sister, we're going to trust and defer to each other. Because as soon as they're right and you're proven wrong, we humble ourselves. And as soon as they're wrong and you're proven right, watch this, we humble ourselves. That's a different approach to, to, to most things. It's, I, I believe God knows best. And so this life of abundance that Pastor Andy desires to bring to our church that we as the people of God, that we can live not out of our survival, that we can live not out of just enough, but there, there would be an abundance of love and a lack of hypocrisy for our brothers and sisters that we don't look at each other and when they wrong us, and yes, they will, when they per persecute us and the world is coming towards Christians, the hostility is growing, but we as the people of God, because we are the people of God, we live differently. There's no way in the world high caliber athletes would sit around and complain about, oh, I gotta work out during the summer, I gotta eat right, I gotta stay away from dangerous activities. No, it's par for the course because they understand because I am an athlete, I have to do certain things. And Mike, listen, I can't exhort us strong enough because we are, we don't do good works to be saved. We do good works because we are. There's a difference. Good works are the fruit of our salvation. They are proof of our salvation. They are not the root of our salvation. And so I wanna encourage each of us to remember God has called us to be fruit trees not trees, we are called to produce fruit. 
And the abundant life says this as the worship team gets in place. The abundant life, and I'm going to do better this time, uh, we're going to pray a prayer of salvation. The abundant life, if you're a non-believer, you've heard me, I didn't mean to thump over the head. If that's what it sounds like, if you're in the room and you're, you're still on this journey to trust Christ and you don't know exactly what that means, listen, we want to work with you. But the, the first step in living a life of abundance, even when your bank account is low, even when that spouse walks away, even when that report is not good, especially when it is, but it's the when it isn't moments. That's not a word, sorry. That we can trust in our God. And the first step is trusting in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says this, God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us. So I want to pray two prayers just quickly because my time has already expired. Prayer number one is for if you're in the room and you say, I don't know Christ. I hear you go on and I love this church. I love the people of this church, but I haven't taken that step. It's simple. It's just simply trusting not in your own work. Different than the faithfulness of walking with Christ, this is that first step into a life of abundance, is trusting in the work of Jesus Christ. So let me pray for you. And then if you've prayed that prayer along with me, I'm gonna ask as the ushers are in the aisle, as soon as I say that prayer, would you just raise your hand so our ushers can put something in your hand and it's gonna help you start learning about faith. The second prayer I'm gonna pray is for the rest of us who are believers, that we would have the endurance no matter the times, no matter the, re the report, because we say as the prophets of old said in the Old Testament, whose report will we believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. Would you bow your heads? Heavenly Father, I thank you for two groups of people in the room today, there are those who have yet to trust in Christ. They may be walking this journey and they may be living out some of the practical requirements that we discussed today, even better than a lot of so-called Christians. But becoming a believer is not about just surviving this world. It's about preparing our hearts for the world to come after this one is done. So I pray that you would exchange in their heart this day their own dependence, their own ability, that they would trust in Christ and Christ alone. They don't have to fully understand what that means, but that they would trust. And if you pray that prayer and you want to know more, would you now raise your hand as the rest of our eyes are still remaining closed and our heads down? And for the remainder of us, may we know that the assignments that you've given believers in regards to our conduct towards each other in this world is immense and it can only be accomplished as we remain in you. Yet, we know that you will never give us an assignment of which your grace is not greater still. We're called to serve each other and to serve our world. And if the word of God is true, and it is, we know the scripture tells us to endure persecution and in this world we will have trouble. It's only your grace that will help us endure. It's only your Holy Spirit living inside of every believer that will help us in our daily walk. Yet as the people of Crossroads, we want to serve you and serve you well. So with full recognition, we still 
as when we first believe, we surrender our hearts and say, Holy Spirit, help me to be faithful to your word. May you alone establish the work of our hands. May our mind's attention and our heart's affection be steered towards you again. What we have not, give us. What we know not, show us. And what we are not, make us. Your name, amen.